Welcome into episode one of the FossCast, where today we're going to hit on a couple topics, including the NBA playoffs and the NFL draft, among others. But we're going to start with those NBA playoffs and a couple of tidbits from the NBA going on right now. Not even going to touch on the Donald Sterling thing because that is still a, a large work in progress. But there's a couple other things going on, a couple of big storylines. Number one is Kevin Durant and his acceptance speech last night. Kevin Durant won the MVP award last night to a a sizable win. Uh, garnered 116 of the 121 possible first place votes. LeBron James, as you might expect, was second and Blake Griffin was third, rounding out. The top five was uh, James Harden and Steph Curry. Now, J Kevin Durant winning the MVP is not the thing that's surprising here. What's surprising, well, not surprising, but what's appalling is the speech that he gave afterwards. After he, was, after he was awarded the MVP, there was no script involved. There was no reading off of a piece of paper. There was no um, simply taking questions and being disinterested. Rather, Durant spoke from the heart. He elicited tears from himself, from Karan Butler, who's been with the team for all of two and a half months, and from, most importantly, his mom. Durant's speech consisted of not only giving the credit off to his teammates, but naming his teammates by name. Players such as Russell Westbrook, who has been taking a beating from the, from the media, from basketball writers ever since he really got good, and ever since the Thunder came into prominence, he's been taking a beating, and Durant singled him out, looked at him during the speech where Durant was accepting the MVP and said, hey, I got your back. You know, whenever anybody comes at you, I got your back no matter what. And more than anything, that shows the type of teammate Kevin Durant is. I mean, the dude, the dude gets it. He understands that it's not all about him. He has a, an incredible sense of humility, one that is well beyond his years, and it comes from his upbringing, and he shed a little light into that last night when he singled out his mom and said, hey, mom, you're the MVP going through all the things that you had to go through for me and my brother to grow up and be the kind of people that they are today. So the Durant speech last night was really something that was empowering, and now the question becomes, could it be something that motivates the Thunder going forward? I mean, it could be for this game at least, their upcoming game against the Clippers, but they've got a lot on their plates to deal with. They've got to deal with the Chris Paul, Blake Griffin pick and roll um, with shooters on the outside. And it's going to be a tough series for the Thunder to win, especially if they continue to give a lot of playing time to Kendrick Perkins and Tabo Cephalosha, two offensive non-factors on the perimeter. Another thing going on in these playoffs, or at least in the NBA right now, is the, the desire of teams to have Steve Kerr. And everybody's desire to get Steve Kerr the current TNT analyst, also if you play in any NBA 2K, you hear him a lot, along with Clark Kellogg, but Clark Kellogg is not involved here. Steve Kerr is being targeted by the Knicks, and now with Mark Jackson out in Golden State, the Warriors are apparently also after him. It's kind of strange, because you never, it's very rare to see so much desire for a coach who's never coached before. Not only has he never been a head coach, he's never been even an assistant coach. He went from playing to being a analyst for TNT to being a GM, and then he wasn't necessarily all that good as a GM, so then went back to being an analyst for TNT. Now he's being coveted by, as I said, the Knicks and Warriors, and apparently two other teams, as a, as a head coach, despite the fact that he literally has zero experience. So, it'll be interesting to see if he ends up taking one of those jobs. It seems like the Knicks is probably the better fit, even though the Warriors probably have better talent. The Warriors play in a far far more difficult conference in the West, and the New York, if he comes in and he's able to turn that team around and get them to a, a playoff series and a playoff victory, he'll be seen as some sort of a savior out there in New York, and being seen as a savior in New York, it's really hard to get any better than that. Last but not least, the story of the Indiana Pacers, what happened to them and where have they gone? They lost game one against the Washington Wizards after playing a seven-game series against the Wolf of Atlanta Hawks, who GM Danny Ferry admitted that they really didn't even want to make the playoffs, but they ended up getting in, and they ended up taking the Pacers to seven. The Pacers, once thought of as the best team in the NBA, have fallen to and really an also-ran in the Eastern Conference, and now Miami looks like it has zero competition from them moving forward. But what happened and how did they get here? Well, 
number one, it happened when the team traded away Danny Granger for for Evan Turner and Lavoy Allen. Did that bring in some sort of competition for Lance Stevenson? Also, people have talked about Lance Stevenson getting snubbed as him trying to do too much and trying to prove that he shouldn't have gotten snubbed and that he should be getting paid this off season. That that's a that's a factor. And also the team chemistry on this team just does not seem to be there. When they were they were beating teams early in the year, they were just destroying them. They seemed like they were having a good time. But now they look dejected. They look like they almost don't want to be there. They look disinterested, which is a far cry from where they were at the beginning of the year when they were spirited about getting the number one seed and defeating the Heat and getting Miami in the Eastern Conference Finals and having Game 7 at home. At this point, they may not even get out of the Eastern Conference semifinals against the Wizards, as the Wizards are already up one nothing in the series. But they'll have to hope that they can turn it around, which they've been hoping for us for about three months now, and it hasn't happened yet. So the Pacers have to hope that they're, they can find their mojo, what made them successful at the beginning of the year, and really turn it on as these playoffs ramp up and get to the later rounds. But until then, the Pacers are going to be an also-ran in the conference. Coming up next, we're going to talk about the the Major League Baseball. What's going on in Major League Baseball right now? It's early in the season, but there are still some significant storylines going on. Stay tuned for that. Back here on the Foscast, and believe it or not, there is baseball going on in the midst of these NBA playoffs and the NFL draft impending actually going on. Thursday, there is some baseball happening, and there are two major storylines down here in Texas, one involving each different team. We'll look at the Rangers first and the Astros second. Number one for the Rangers, they're 2-7 and seven in their last nine games. What is the problem for a team that some people believed was a lock to win the AL West? Well, number one for the Rangers, the pitching. The pitching has still been a problem, a problem that a lot of people in Texas believed it would be with people, with guys like Robbie Ross and Tanner Shepard joining the rotation, moving from the bullpen. Robbie Ross has just gotten smoked his last two times out. Martin Perez was an ace, had a 20-something streak, any streak of not giving up a run. Then he was smoked in his last time out. <clears throat> so, Rangers starting pitching has been an absolute issue. And what do they do to fix it? Well, problem is there's not much. The Moving Robbie Ross for example, from the bullpen to the starting rotation, not only wasn't a great idea, but it also depletes the bullpen because you're down a bullpen arm. Same with Tanner Shepers. Natalie Feliz still is in the minors trying to figure out what's wrong with his velocity. You've got some pitching issues for this team, and hence Mitch Moreland had to come in and pitch last night. And hey, let's be honest, Mitch Moreland did himself a pretty dang good job. Came in through about 94 a couple times, finished the inning throwing a 94-mile-an-hour fastball in the hands, was responsible for the only 1-2-3 inning for the Rangers last night. And that's not going to get it done. If your pitchers can't come out and get 1-2-3 innings, 3 up, 3 down, then there's going to be a problem. You're not going to win very many ball games like that, and the Rangers lost 12-1 to last night. Adrian Beltre is back healthy, though. Prince Fielder is still there, and Alex Rios is still there. So the three, four, five guys in the lineup are still there. Um, so you have to imagine this offense is going to get on track at some point. Elvis Andrews has been struggling lately, has just been not hitting the ball at all lately. So that just certainly does not help. Him getting on track is going to be key, because right now the Rangers really have four hitters. They have Shinsu Shu at the top, and they have three, four, five Beltre, Fielder, and Rios. If those guys aren't producing, it's going to be very hard for this lineup to score any runs with the replacement level players they have in there right now. And for the Astros, well, how did they get this bad? Why are they so bad at baseball in general? Well, let's take a little history lesson here. Go back to 2005 when the Astros made the World Series and look at let's look at that roster. Let's look at the starters. They had Bagwell at first, who was the at the end of his rope. It was one of his last years. They had Chris Burke in left field, who was never good again, ended up hurting himself, swinging and missing, separated his shoulder, and just was never the same hitter after that. Craig Biggio at second base, who was in the twilight of his career, so he chased 3,000 hits. Adam Everett, at shortstop, couldn't hit, and that was eventually not good enough for the, really, for the league. He was a great defensive shortstop, but he could not hit. Morgan Ensberg had a fluke season, was an MVP candidate, was never good again after that year. At third base, catcher Brad Ausmus was once again at the end of his rope in the majors. Willie Tavares was a solid player 
for the team, but was never great again after that season four in 2005, and then Jason Lane had an absolute fluke year. Pitcher rotation was great. Roy Oswalt, Andy Pettit, Roger Clemens, and Brandon Backey. So in 10 years, how'd they get from there to here? Well, for the Astros, in about 2009, when Ed Wade came in, they tried to chase glory. They tried to chase mediocrity rather than saying, okay, this is cyclical. You're not going to always be good. You're going to have to go through some down years to get to the good years. And rather than sitting on 70, 80, 70 wins or so, they traded some of their prospects for guys like Miguel Tejada. They traded five prospects for Miguel Tejada. Um, traded for guys like Oscar Villarreal or Aubrey Huff. And guys that really weren't going to move the needle all that much. And so because the Astros were chasing mediocrity so often and just absolutely depleting their farm system, they were left with nothing. We're left with absolutely nothing, and so that last year when you had Michael Bourne and Roy Oswald and Hunter Pence and, Je and Lance Berkman on the same team, all of those guys had to go to replace the farm system. And on the major league level, there wasn't talent enough to even come close to making a playoff run, and that's why you saw GM Jeff Lunau come in and just gut the major league system, or the major league team, and try to rebuild the farm system, which they've been very successful in doing, but the problem is that there's no talent at the major league level right now. George Springer is really the first player of the minor league crop of talent to come up to the major league level, and he has struggled mightily since he has arrived on the scene in Houston. But they have the talent in the minor leagues, but it's going to still be a couple years before they are competitive. If everything breaks right for the Astros, they will be competitive next year. They will fight for an AL West division crown either the following year or the year after that. The drought is coming to an end, Astros fans, but it's still going to continue. They can't hit, and their pitching has been solid this year, not great. Their bullpen has been terrible because really a lot of bullpen guys are guys that failed as starters but had the stuff, and because the Astros depleted their farm system, they don't have those former starters turned into bullpen guys. Um, instead, they've got guys that are just trying to make it on the major league level. So, the Astros' drought is real. They're going to hit 100 losses again this year. They're probably going to get the number one pick in the draft again this year. And it's up to Jeff Liu now to continue to develop these prospects and make them as good as they can be. We'll take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to take a look at tomorrow's NFL Draft Round 1. The NFL Draft is finally here. The NFL Draft Round 1 kicks off tomorrow. With extensive draft coverage having been going on for probably the past two or three months, the question of who the Texans are going to take with the number one overall pick has been mostly solved at this point. Jadavian Clowney seems to be the consensus pick for the Houston Texans. Khalil Mack has gotten some talk at that spot, but that seems like more of a scheme fit, which is not a good idea given the fact that if Romeo Cornell isn't there in a couple years, then the scheme might be different, and Khalil Mack might not fit that new scheme. So you have to take the player that is the most talented and has the most upside um, to be a great player as the number one overall pick, and that's without a doubt to Davian Clowney. Now, if they trade out of that pick, then that opens up a wealth of options, including quarterback, including other defensive slots. So the number one pick in the draft is going to be Jadavian Clowney. The only question is, is that pick going to be made by the Houston Texans, or are they going to trade back? with, say, the Atlanta Falcons, who are rumored to be interested in moving up to that number one spot. Atlanta sits at six, so you have to imagine that if Texans are able to move back to slot six, they might be able to get a shot at Bortles or anybody else. Why did I not say Johnny Manziel? Because Johnny Manziel is going number four to the Browns. He's been the talk of this NFL combine and all the time leading up to the draft. People have said, Oh, where's Johnny Football going to go? Is he going to go number one to the Texans? Is he going to stay in town and stay in Texas and go to Houston and try to revive that franchise? Is he going to go number three to the Jaguars and try to revive a franchise that has been in the dumps? Is he going to go to Oakland? Is he going to go to Cleveland? Is he going to go to Minnesota? Where is Johnny Manziel going to go, and how good is he going to be? At this point, it seems that Johnny Manziel is, is going to go to the Browns. He seems like the number one quarterback on a lot of people's boards. He just excelled in his pro day, whether it's because he had everybody in entourage, he was wearing the helmet, he had the rap music playing in the background at A&M. 
Either way, his pro day was phenomenal, as opposed to guys like Teddy Bridgewater, whose pro day really wasn't very good. Bridgewater was the guy who, at the end of the year, was on the top of a lot of people's boards. People thought that he was the most ready NFL quarterback, and he would be the first quarterback off the board without a doubt. But then the postseason drafts things happen, the combine, the pro day, and Bridgewater's measurables just didn't quite add up. Manziel's did, and he's sitting in the slot of the best quarterback available. So as of right now, it looks like Johnny Football is not going to be in Texas. Sorry, Texans fans, and sorry, Cowboys fans, because apparently Jerry Jones is interested in getting himself his hands on Johnny Football wearing that Cowboys uniform. But that would not be a good choice, because you have to remember that Tony Romo is still under contract, under an immense contract, mind you, that kicked in only last year. I was paying him five years, $100 million, so there's no real reason to take Johnny Manziel. He's going to be a backup to Tony Romo. You don't take a guy like that with that much popularity to ride the bench. And you don't take a quarterback that's making as much money as Tony Romo and have him ride the bench. So if the Cowboys end up taking Johnny Manziel, it will not only be a colossal surprise, but also a colossal mistake. As for the rest of the draft, I expect to see Sammy Watkins or the Jaguars and try to give Blaine Gabbert somebody to throw to. Well, not Blaine Gabbert anymore. Maybe Chad Henney or whoever ends up trying to throw the ball for that Jaguars franchise that has just been abysmal in the past couple of years. Khalil Mack, who is talked to go to the Texans at, at number one, will probably go number five to the Raiders, as most mocks have it now. But Johnny Manziel going number four to the Browns as the first quarterback off the board will really get the, get the draft going. We'll open up a lot of holes, and we'll open up a lot of storylines as to where Blake Bortles will go. Where will Teddy Bridgewater go? Will he go in the second round? Will he fall as far as the second round? The Texans have the number one pick in the second round as they do in the first. If Teddy Bridgewater falls to the second round somehow, you almost have to imagine. You can almost put money on the Texans taking him at that slot. And if he does not, maybe the Texans still look at a quarterback at that slot. Maybe they look at a guy like Tom Savage out of Pittsburgh, maybe they look at a guy like Jimmy Garoppolo out of Eastern Illinois, or Eastern Michigan, I'm not sure, sorry. But, with that first pick in the second round, you could imagine the Texans going quarterback, because they do not see a big gap between the top quarterbacks and the second tier quarterbacks. So, the Texans, or whoever's in that number one slot, is going to pick Jadavian Clowney. That has almost been decided and is almost a given at this point. The rest of the draft, not so decided, not so much a given other than Manziel probably going number two to the Brown, number four to the Browns. There has been talk of him going to the Rams at two. What's their interest in Johnny Manziel? They brought him in for some meetings. They brought him in for some private workouts. But my idea is that they're trying to see what Johnny Manziel's value is. They understand that there are some teams out there that really want to get their hands on Johnny football. And the Rams hold that number two pick. And they want to know what Johnny Manziel's value is. Because if they decide to trade out because some team gets trigger happy and wants to move up and get Manziel, they want to know what to ask for. They want to know what Manziel is worth. And that way, they have done their homework, they know what to ask for Manziel, and they know what a fair asking price is for Johnny Football at that number two position. They don't have, they don't have any interest in him. They have Sam Bradford. And Bradford's not great, but he's not at the point where you have to replace him just yet. And so... The Rams are not going to take Johnny Manziel at two. Instead, this is a smokescreen, as there are a lot of at this point with the draft approaching. But we shall see. The draft begins in about 12 hours or so, and at that point, a lot of a lot of questions are going to be answered, but more questions are going to be asked after the teams make their first picks in the 2014 NFL Draft. I'd like to thank you for listening to the Foscast, the first edition, hopefully one of many, we will come back tomorrow and see what's going on in the world of sports. Maybe we will be talking about that first round.